Hello, and welcome to Rambling Reality. I know I'm a couple weeks late. I'm sorry. A lot happened in the past couple weeks. I had a job. Now I don't have a job. I was working as administrative assistant. Now I'm not. So that means I have more time to do more podcasts, apparently, while I look for more jobs. Because the job market is so easy right now. But during my last job, I actually had the opportunity to work as a cashier briefly. And I learned a couple of things about that. So the podcast will be discussing that. But mostly what I'm going to be talking about at this exact moment is the fact that I've had Wild Pantheon Press up for a month, but I just haven't had time to do anything with it. Life's been mad crazy since I had my birthday. Like I said, I had a job for five weeks. No, I don't. And so I haven't really had time to focus on it or to even focus on some of my Dragon Con stuff, my stories I still need to write up. But I do have a, a launch with this. As soon as this podcast goes up, there should be a, a story on wildpantheonpress.com, which will showcase <laughs> what I call scanning Tetris. But it kind of goes back to what this podcast is about. Okay, so to explain, I'm not actually talking about the game Tetris. I'm actually talking about packaging and marketing and product and, and SKU numbers and UPC codes and barcodes and whatever you want to call those many things. Anyway, so I've got to finish putting it up tomorrow and coding it before this goes live. I'll restart this for a little bit. I was just going to have a podcast on the bad marketing of putting those UPC codes in places that the cashiers can't scan. And when I was writing it out, my, this is what I want to talk about notes because that's the way I am usually, my fiance Sven said, no, what you need to do is you need to write this as something for part of Wild Pantheon. And I said, okay. So I started writing it and writing it. And the thing is like 1600 words. Needless to say, I had a lot to talk about. But what I learned while doing the article was... Some things are kind of common sense for me. It may not be common sense for those doing the marketing and the product design. For instance, seriously, those cereal and granola bar things where the scanning code is like underneath that flap, that is a seriously bad flaw in design. In part, because when you're trying to scan it, you've got the crinkly paper, you've got the food product going over it, so it's not actually easy to scan, and you have to move that flap. If you're working at a small store, like a, a bodega, an eatery, something that's got a lot of customers in a quick amount of time, you know, gas station, that can get really annoying trying to scan that if you're having to use one of those wands. So I came up with this plan. As beautiful as marketing is, and Lord knows there are some beautiful marketing and product designs on the front, the backs need to be worked on a little bit. I think that before a product can be a product design bag or something on the back can be okay, they need to have to go and work on this and, you know, print up like 60 to 100 products, whatever. And have to go try and sell these as the cashier, ring these products up during the, the busiest hours of different venues. So supermarkets, gas stations, you know, uh, college campuses, bookstores, you know, the things that you know that they're going to be constantly, you know, being bought from. I think what needs to happen is, is that the designers have to go through and see the way it works and the best way that it works because sometimes the back of the product is beautiful but if you've got a bag of chips and your code is on the bottom of that bag it's really hard to sit there and scan it if it's crooked or if there's too much air in the bag or if the chips are not down there or if the chips are smaller or if you've got like pretzels which are not going to fill a bag anyway in the normal in the normal, like, compressed, compact way. I think, I really think the, the marketers and the designers and the people need to run more tests on the viability of doing that because customers get really annoyed if you're not quick sometimes and they're in a hurry. Like, if they've got 10 minutes to get from point A to point B and they're getting themselves a 
Special K granola bar and a bag of Cheeto puffs. And you want it to make it look really nice and you want to eat it so you have some kind of food in you because, you know, you don't want to pass out. Your time is limited and the cashier's time is just as limited because there could be 10 people behind you. So there needs to be some kind of consistency in that. Um, but I will say that the product designs on the front are often beautiful and they're memorable. In the article I talked about, I quoted a bunch of different places and um, there's a place called the Food Marketing Institute, I think is the name of it. And that's an amazing resource, by the way, if you want to know about supermarkets and, and marketing products and stuff, go there. Seriously, amazing. But I also read an article on um, Adweek. And Adweek discussed how designers and, you know, retail are starting to use more of the neurosciences of um, what makes someone so there. They used a couple of different examples of... Um, products some were UK some were not there was just a bunch of different ways of doing it and the one that stood out to me though was the Campbell soups labels I'm sure you guys have seen them they're the ones with a steaming bowl of soup in homemade style you know in mom, like from mom's kitchen you know that that invokes a very obvious need even when you see it like I don't know about y'all but if I buy a can of soup I probably can't afford Campbell's I'm I'm down here in the 50 cent a, a can aisle, if not less, if I can find it. And the thing that I've learned is I'll see the Campbell's soup, but I'll end up buying the other brand. But I'm still intrigued and I'm still, you know, aware because of that product. And so they talked about that, but I actually thought of the chunky soups, the Campbell's chunky soups which are, you know, the ones that the football players advertise for people that are in the U.S. But I also thought of it because if you look at the, if, if you look at the product, it's got this big spoon that's practically a ladle. And you're sitting here and you see this big, chunky, you know, rustic looking food. I mean, it's food that appeals to me, especially as it gets colder and it gets, you know, less time for, say, chicken salad sandwiches and more time for soup. Typically, I make my own, but occasionally I will buy others, as noted. But I also like, you know, buying some of the, like, beef stews and stuff, because I grew up on those. My, I had working parents and a lower middle class, like, not even middle class, we were working class. So, I grew up on those kind of foods, and that kind of calls back, and sometimes that'll fill my meal up, and I won't even notice it. I have an, un I have an unconscious need and an un unconscious bias, which is what that ad week uh, talked about. It kind of draws into you the packaging and the labeling and the what kind of brings you home. Like, we all remember New Coke. New Coke didn't work for nothing. But part of it was also because they changed the product design. There's something very familiar, especially for me being in Atlanta and from Atlanta. The red can, the swoopy Coca-Cola font. And knowing that it's the original one and it's, you know, the, the classic and it's, it's what I grew up on. I mean, I can't drink it anymore as a diabetic, but I see those and I know what I'm going to get. Like, you know, I know what a Coke Zero will taste like or a Coke Zero uh, cherry, which are my favorite ones of the, of the Zero products besides Sprite Zero. Um, but it kind of reminds you of things and there's an unconscious need that's filled when you see these designs, but you want to be engaged so that's the Tetris thing, by the way. I, when I was stocking the shelves briefly this week, while I was, you know, employed still, um, I would do it in color rows, but I wouldn't do it like in Tetris where you wanted to eliminate the entire row, you wanted them to sell out. What I would do is I would use it like golds and greens and yellows next to reds and blues and I would do it that way because then your eye would be drawn down because I'd create like a lattice work of, of keeping it going. And it was actually pretty interesting because I put like the Cheeto puffs next to the Lay's and the thin ring golds or whatever the pretzels are called. I put them together and I noticed how that worked. And then Coke, I don't know if you realize this, but Coke actually has a pretty um Standard displays have to look like if you look on the side of a of a Coke display, you'll probably find them. Um, and I noticed there that they didn't always go together, and it bothered me, but I couldn't control it. But actually, if you follow it, sometimes you can see the pattern, like you'd see like Coke products, 
And then you'd see like a discordant sprite in the middle and you'd go, what? And, but then you'd see back to the Coke products and then you'd realize, well, no, that actually made sense because the sprite stands out in that spot. You know, just like the, um, whatever their ginger ale is. I don't know. The only ginger ale I drink is raspberry swips, sweeps, swips, whatever. That's all I drink. Uh, but it's very interesting watching the lines as it folds down. I was looking at, we were having to stock the uh, Peace Tea cans, and I was really interested in the way that they are, because they're very bright, colorful, wow, and it's very interesting to see the manipulation, but it's not a manipulation of, you know, I want you to buy this, it's a, do you need this? It's a very subtle manipulation, and it's a subtle manipulation that I actually don't mind that that product placement and product marketing and stuff does because it introduces me to new ideas, ways to complete a meal that I hadn't thought of. Like, I'm poor, so I would go to the Dollar Tree and get those five packs of um, peanuts. I'm sure you guys have seen them. It's the, the Lance's peanuts are like a buck. I'd go there, I'd go to Family Dollar because they're a buck because, you know, they're all, all these places are basically owned by the same people. Dollar General, Dollar Tree, Family Dollar, they're all pretty much the same the same group of people for the most part because you can see they share the same products anyway but what I would notice is I felt better when I got fired I wanted three things well I wanted two things I wanted something that had caffeine in it and then I wanted pizza because I haven't had a pizza like a store-bought pizza in like six months I'm very careful with my money right now I can't afford not to be so I'd be doing that and I was like going back through the family dollar, trying to find something to drink. And they had three for three for the Diet Dr. Peppers and the two liters. And I was like, hey, look, it's in my budget. So I went by and I was going blah, blah, blah. And I was walking and I saw the packages of peanuts and I went, want those. And at first I couldn't figure out why. And then I was standing at the counter and I realized something. For me, I have a ton of little Debbies at the, in, the, in the house because my roommate buys them. But what I wanted was something that was salty to go with it. I wanted something that would be really good, really interesting, something that would stand out. So that's what I did. I grabbed that and I went, oh, right, that it literally completed my meal. It's part of my comfort foods. Peanuts have always been part of my comfort foods because when I was very little, my godmothers would take me on plane rides. And of course, you know, back then you would get like honey roasted peanuts from Delta all the time. And as a child, you got pretty much whatever you wanted because I wanted to keep the kid happy. So I'd get something to drink and get a lot of peanuts. So for me, peanuts are a comfort food. So I felt my entire meal was fixed because of that. And even though it wasn't even the greatest product placement, I saw it on the end cap and went, oop, mine. The idea, though, is, is if you go into, like, Dollar Tree, you'll see that they've got everything lined up, but it's lined up in a very... Um, marketing way you'll see the lance's you know um p uh, peanut butter and like buffalo blue cheese chicken and all that kind of crackers and then you'll see like something else and then you'll see the peanuts and then above that you'll see another kind of peanut or another kind of, of nut or whatever they've got an extra of and so it's very interesting to watch that and even though i wasn't in dollar tree this time my mind had instantly connected that thought of this the summer I've had some really crazy literal moments and some very stressful moments and so I went oh I should do something about that so I did now as promised in the last podcast I was going to make this connect to pop culture for me food is pop culture as an American, pop culture, marketing, ads, that stuff hap that stuff really picked up in the 1920s, which is part of my research on the um, uh, Weimar Republic's New Woman, but that's when, you know, product placements really started to pop and, and it became this decadent thing. And so what I did is I was thinking that to me it's just as pop culture as talking about how to get away with murder or what the latest housewives are doing or... Because all these things are part of the American culture. I mean, especially the Coke stuff, because I'm, again, I'm born and raised in Atlanta. But I just wanted to really delve into 
why people do the packaging products, knowing how the marketing works. Um, I'm not a market major. I was an English major because math is not my friend. I like math. Math is not my friend personally. So, um, it's not my area, but working in the four days for four or five hours every day, you know, it was allowing me to see how products are bought, the what really appeals. Like, those prepackaged um, sandwiches you guys see at the hospitals, I'm sure you've seen them. You put them in there, you put in your 250, and you get these looking sandwiches to eat while you're sitting there waiting to find out what's going on with your loved one or, you know, why you're still in the emergency room four hours later. And that's kind of what they had at this, but theirs was much more vibrant. Uh, the person that does the retail management, I, I actually noticed that she was talking about how, you know, she doesn't want something that's going to be bland. She doesn't want something that's going to be hospital food-esque. And I was looking at the different food and I was noticing that it was selling. And the thing that sold the most was not only was it a really good display, but the information was right there and it said exactly what was in it. And I found that, you know, turkey BLTs and egg sandwiches, egg salad sandwiches rather, um, chicken salad, tuna salad, all these things that are comfort food for a lot of people were selling. And at first I was a little bit confused and then I went, well, A, it's lunch for a lot of these people, but B, it's also because it's getting cold. Like it's hot in the afternoons, but when people are having early lunches, it's still cold and a sandwich is, marketing wise, a sandwich is brilliant because it's the perfect kind of food and the packaging with the skew and the UPC, whatever the heck they want to call it this week. It was right there. It was easy to scan. It was They knew exactly where it was. They would show it to you. They would point it to you so they could get their food and go. Versus a bag of chips or something where you kind of have to fiddle around and find it. And the, skewed, the, the scanner doesn't always work on the UPC code. And there's a lot of blah, 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 blah. It, just, it was not pretty. So I think it's very interesting. And I was really intrigued by that side of it and I'm kind of wondering what I can do with learning this information other than make my really interesting job article in my podcast about it because I don't think anybody really cares about the barcoding <laughs> of food labeling but I think it's a very valuable aspect because a positive experience for a customer means a return customer. Think about it. When you get pissed off at a, at a food company or you get pissed off at a location, you tell everybody. If you have a really good experience, you can do that, but most often you don't. So if you create this environment where people will buy more, they will be more loyal to your brand. I noticed there was one product called, I think it was Owl, and it was a, it was a piece of, it was like a candy bar type style, but it was supposed, it was meant to keep you awake. It was like a caffeinated bar or whatever, I guess. And I noticed the, the the UPC code was right there. It was, there was just a little bit of the label to where the product boosted up the, the label, but it didn't hide anything. It wasn't behind the flap for opening the product or anything. And you could really just scan it and go. There wasn't a lot of drama with it. And so it's very interesting to me how some people obviously put thought into that and others just assume pretty as a seller and it is but customers get frustrated if they can't get their product if they can't get their product they're not going to go back if they don't go back your business is not going to succeed it's more than just making a pretty front you know how you can't judge a book by its cover well you can't judge a product sellability unless you can sell the product and so i think it's a very forgotten element to product packaging and i would love if someone knew more about it and would talk to me and Catch me at Jessica Hannon 81 and find out what it is. And I should probably start learning to spell my name out. It's J-E-S-S-I-C-A-H-A-N-N-A-N 81 on Twitter. I'm on Instagram. I don't know how this would have anything to do with, well, I guess product could be Instagram. I'm on Facebook. At, I think it's like Jessica.Hannon.587. Um... 
but mostly I'm on Twitter right now because Twitter goes on my phone everywhere I go. The life of journalist, right? Um, if you guys know anything, if you guys hear anything, that'd be great. This is available on iTunes now, by the way. My podcast is available on iTunes. It updates when I update, which woo, means that this one will be updating in a little bit as I babble, babble, babble. And I'm noticing my 10-minute thing that I promised in the beginning is turning into 20. Hopefully, I won't go to an hour. Maybe I'll go to 30 minutes, but I promise you after that, I probably will stop because I just get bored of my own self. I'm hoping that you guys rate it. I'm hoping you guys like it. If you don't like it, please don't rate it. Um, but mostly what I want to do is I want to hear back from people that are listening about what they want to hear in this podcast now. I really want to hear what's going on. I want to hear what you guys are interacting with. Like Nicholas Young from The Machine, he's amazing because he fed back with me about when I was talking about when I got really scared driving. He actually talked to me. He talked about like defense driving courses and stuff like that. And, and I, I want that. I want that kind of interaction. I want to know what you guys are thinking about this sort of stuff because, I mean, granted, I'm just talking to myself, but if you guys are going to download it, I at least want you guys to be entertained. Um, contact me. Let me know. If you want to catch me at Wild Pantheon, it's wild, dot com. Wild Pantheon has my own meanings, which I talked about in the last podcast, I think. Oh, no, my birthday podcast, which would be September the 12th. I think I went on on the 12th or the 13th of September. Um, That's going live. Like I said, I'm going to have my my little article up that my amazing Sven encouraged me to write and edited for me and made it make a little bit more sense because I didn't know I was writing an article until I was about, oh, a thousand words in. It's my way. I don't know. It's the same way I used to make papers and when I was in college. Uh, I'm also going to be applying for a couple of scholarships to maybe go to school, grad school overseas. So we'll see how that goes. And I'm going to try and get everything together that I can. Which means it's going to be a very busy couple of weeks because it's coming up on <laughs> Sven's birthday, actually. Um, I don't know. You guys just tell me what you want to hear. I'm open to anything. I mean, hell, I can talk about Jim and the hologram till I'm blue in the face. That was my that was my thing. I'm not talking about the movie because the movie never happened. Let me be very clear. The Jim hologram movie didn't happen. Not talking about it. Nope. Not, mm-mm. I'm sorry. I love my niece dearly, but I ain't going to go watch that movie with her. I managed to watch Lord of the Rings, a movie I didn't even like for the most part for my little brother when we were waiting for Harry Potter number two to come out. That movies, but no. Not doing gym too much of my childhood. It's just, no, wrong, bad, wrong. Um, I don't know. I guess I'm going to stop rambling now. I know some people are listening for the first time probably now. And some of them know me from Live Journal. So, hi, guys. Um, I hope you enjoy it. If you don't, fuss at me. You know where to find me. I'm always in the one couple of places over and over and over again. Catch me on the many, many roundups and the <laughs> and the free for alls. I'm gonna sign off because it's two o'clock in the morning on a Saturday, Friday, whatever, however you want to say that. And I still have to work like the Dickens, and my fiance is calling me. So have fun, guys. Bye. See you next time. And no, I'm not gonna promise what's gonna happen next because I have no idea. Bye bye. Opening intro is done by Fantasia on a theme by Thomas Tallis, also known as the Tallis Fantasia, and it is a string orchestra by British composer Ralph Vaughn Williams, performed by U.S. Army Strings, and I thank them so much for allowing me to make my own version of it. Thank you, guys.